Check, one, two. All right, hello everybody. Um, today what I'm gonna be doing, uh, this is Steve from Guitar Zoom, and uh, what we're gonna be doing is just answering some questions and talking about some theory and application things, stuff like that. Um, so what I've done is I've compiled a, a, a whole lot of things to talk about, and I'm gonna try and get through as much as I can in the next hour. Um, but first I just want to, to say thanks for, uh, you know, sticking in there. Thanks for practicing. Uh, thanks for all of the, the positive comments, and especially, I am so proud of the Guitar Zoom uh, community pages that, that we've got up. So there's just a ton of you out there that I want to thank you for, for helping out, you know, answering questions to, to help other people and, and um, you know, just giving your input all the time. I, I, when I was growing up, that was something that was always really cool here in, in Fargo, North Dakota. I had some friends that were guitar players and we would always just get together and we would just talk about guitar and about music and about bands and about, you know, guitar players and strings and, you know, whatnot. And it just kept everything really exciting and, and kept everything really motivated. And, and uh, so I just want to say thank you for that. Um, so go, let's go ahead and get started here. What we're going to be doing, uh, let's start off with what I did was I kind of compiled a bunch of different emails into one thing because um, they all sort of approach the same question. So this one goes out to uh, Seppo, to Tom, and to Alex, and to Cindy. Um, so let me just sort of, you know, organize what this is. It says, it's important to manage all the pentatonic positions, right? Uh, however, this may lead to excessive and messy scale playing instead of clear musical phrasing. You have rightly paid attention to this risk. Uh, the question or problem is, how to select one's own optimal use of pentatonic positions across the fretboard. Um, so let's just start with that. The big thing is understanding that your fretboard, if you have any element of limitations to your fretboard, which we all do, right? Um, but if you have any elements of, of limitations to seeing a scale, like your minor pentatonic, and again, we'll just go with the, the A minor pentatonic, which is at the fifth fret. Um, if you have limitations visually, the problem is you're not going to be able to use that position on any creative level. Um, if you have minimal information, like if you move to the third position and you have minimal understanding of the third position, when you go there, you're not creating on a creative level, you're creating on a memorization level. And what I mean by that is if you're playing in this first position here, <laughs> and you're playing whatever. And then you move to the third position, but you don't really know the third position. Then you're up there trying to go. And everything becomes more elementary again because you're not using it creatively. You're just using it methodically because you're trying to figure out how it goes. So the, the trick to all of this is the more you understand about your fretboard, should not lead to a, a messy outcome of your playing. It just gives you more opportunity. It's in your understanding of what it is that you're trying to do. The, the, the trick to, to, I mean, really anything in life, I suppose, is having a course of action that you understand. So when you go to solo over something, you have an idea of, of how you're going to approach your solo. Now let's take two examples. Let's take you have a song where the solo comes up and the solo is, 40 seconds long. It's a long solo. You got a minute, something like that, to just solo over the top of something. So you're on stage, you're in front of an audience, and you've got a long solo now that you're going to start playing. You've got time to develop. You've got time to do something that's way more monstrous and, and effective in the middle, and then to come back out again. And I always think of it kind of like a, a balloon, right? A balloon starts off tapered, and then it gets big, and then it tapers off again. For me, that's kind of the overall definition of what a solo is when you have time to develop a longer solo. Um, you can't just play fast the whole time for 40 seconds and then the next song play fast the whole time and the next song play fast the whole time because the truth is, is technique can be very, very effective and very useful in a person's playing. And if you've obviously seen some of my video stuff, I talk about it all the time. But if you do it all the time, it becomes less impressive. Like your audience just goes, oh, he's doing that again. You can't do that. You have to use it 
sparingly, just like everything else that you're doing. So the, the, the initial concept of this longer solo that we're gonna be playing is that we wanna build some element of melody, of phrasing, right? Of, of rhythm uh, understanding and, and, and accenting and all those sorts of things. Everything that we talk about on a regular basis and all the, the master classes that we're learning about. So if I had a rhythm track that I'm playing along with and I'm going... I'm trying to set up a scenario. Now, right now I'm not playing over th anything, and that's something that's really important for you to understand too, is if I'm playing over nothing, I'm just playing, I'm just freely playing. I might be you know, thinking about things or developing rhythm or whatever, but when, the, when there's a chord progression underneath you, your obligation as a guitar player, as a musician, is to respond to that chord progression. Okay, so I'm not going to get off the tangent just yet. We're, we're going to keep going with this. But the trick is, is understanding that once that chord progression starts playing, your job is to acknowledge that chord progression, acknowledge its tempo, its rhythm feel, right? Is it a swing? Is it a straight rhythm? What's happening there? Um, and very, 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 very much so, it's chords. If there's an A minor chord being played, you need to acknowledge that A minor chord. This is where the messy comes in, is when people play... And they're, they're completely oblivious to what's happening underneath them. They're just thinking about fretboard. They're just thinking about the notes on the fretboard or the positions on the fretboard. And they're not acknowledging what's actually happening musically underneath them. So this is where like when you're just sitting around in your house and you're just playing, I do it all the time. It, it's an awesome thing to do. But it has no direction until there's something underneath you. Once you have a chord progression underneath you, you now have an obligation to respond to that chord progression. So regardless of whether I'm using one position or two positions or all five positions, that never goes away. It's just if I come back to my balloon theory, in the beginning I'm going to, if I have a longer solo, I'm going to acknowledge those chords because I have time. And then for me personally, because of the, the kind of music I grew up playing and the kinds of things I like to do, what happens is um, I like a solo that somewhere in the middle kind of punches you upside the head. I, that's the kind of thing I like. I mean, the players that I enjoy listening to, they start off, they sweet talk you, and then all of a sudden they kick you, and then they come back out again. Like, if I was going to use a, a prime example, I could use somebody like Neil Schoen from um, Journey, or Steve Lukather from Toto, or, uh, I mean, there's just a host of guitar players like Richie Kotzen or Eric Johnson or Steve Vai or Joe Satriani, which are the, the usuals that everybody says, but there's so many other players. There's a, a, a gentleman by the name of Glenn Proudfoot, if you've ever heard of Glenn Proudfoot, amazing at this sort of thing. Uh, another one of my favorite guitar players, which I haven't heard from in a while, Blues Saracino is his name. Um, just an amazing guitar player. Um, you know, a George Lynch from Dokken. I mean, I could go on and on and on for an hour about these guys. Nuno Betancourt from Extreme. But they all, they all have that ability um, where they'll set you up and then they'll do something and then they'll bring it back down. Now, does that mean that every single solo should be that way? Absolutely not. Every situation is different. But if you never acknowledge those rhythms and, and those, those uh, chords and things like that, your, your, your soloing has no context. There's nothing, you're just moving around. And I know this because that's exactly what I did for, for many years when I first started learning how to play. I knew my fretboard and I could move around, but I was just, in my mind, I was, now that I look back at it, I was just pretending. I wasn't actually making music, I was just pretending to make music. Um, and so I try and avoid that as much as humanly possible. Um, so I'm not, I'm not just playing the same thing over and over and over or just playing blindly over the top of a chord progression. So when you say, however this may lead to excessive and messy scale playing, I think the trick is, is in now your application, right? So I've got this A chord being played and I come up here and I go. It doesn't have to be messy, it's just, it's more methodical until I get to that middle section, and that's where I'm going to try and throw out something crazy, and then I'm going to come back out. Now let's take the second scenario. Let's say you don't have a long solo, right? Sometimes you have jam tracks that you might get from me or from wherever else, and you can solo for five minutes. I mean, you got all the time in the world to try and develop things. 
But in the real world, you don't have five minutes to solo. Your singer would probably quit the band, right, or or whatever. Uh, everybody else would start, you know, your other musicians in your band would start throwing, you know, clothing at you, like shoes and whatever. So you don't have that kind of time. Sometimes you only have 20 seconds. Sometimes you only have 10 seconds. So the trick is you get so excited, you're like, ah, oh, I got to do something crazy because I only have 10 seconds. I'm going to try and show everybody, you know, what I can do. And that's okay sometimes, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes the trick is, is just to do something that's really pretty and, and melodic. Um, Neil Schoen will do that all the time. Um, again, if he's got a longer solo, he's always going to go into something. But if he doesn't, if you listen to like, you know, Still They Ride by Journey, which is one of my favorite songs, um, he really doesn't do that. He stays, he stays pretty constant. Uh, another one that I really love is a guy by the name of uh, Lincoln Brewster. Uh, who used to play with Steve Perry, ironically, the singer from Journey, when he went on his solo, when he, when he quit Journey. And now he does a bunch of contemporary Christian stuff, and he's just, he's just an amazing, amazing guitar player. And uh, same thing for him. Sometimes he'll just rip a cool solo, and sometimes when he doesn't have a lot of time or the, the, the situation calls for it, he just plays very melodically. Um, and so I want you to think about that that it's not so much how much of your fretboard, it's the way you approach what you're doing. But I will say, the less of your fretboard you can see, obviously the, the more limiting it is because there's only so many things that you can do. You know, I love being able to move. And then I'll move into whatever it is I'm gonna do. then you come back out again. But again, right now, this doesn't have any context. What I truly love to do, and I will encourage you till the, the end of time to do, is you take jam tracks, whether it's a blues jam, jam track, and don't always use blues jam tracks. I mean, use pop jam tracks or just ballad jam tracks. I mean, all kinds of different things. And start learning to be way more intuitive on what you're going to play. Um, and again, you know, this is what this whole thing is about is discussion. So I'm going to keep discussing, right? And hopefully this answers a, a vast amount of questions out there. What to play is the question. It always is. You know, you're either playing from a, 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 an analytical standpoint. Well, it's a G chord, so I should emphasize G or B or D or something like that. Or it's coming from more of a, a, a visual standpoint. Well, there's a G chord, so I'm going to try and emphasize something about the G. And then the D chord comes out, so I'm going to emphasize D. And all of those are very valid. No, none are more or less valid than each other. And sometimes you're just going off pure intuition. You're not thinking about anything. You're playing and you're hearing a melody in your head. and you're just kind of moving, you're not thinking about shapes and you're not thinking about theory, you're just feeling the music is moving and something inside you, which really is music, is kind of telling you you should go up or you should go down or, and you just start, you just start going with that. Those are all three, the, the theoretical aspect, the visual aspect and just the intuition aspect, they're all completely and equally valid. And the trick is learning how to use all of those. So for me personally, guys, I would rather have more options every single time on my fretboard. But the trick is I can't use all of the options all of the time. It's learning how to methodically be able to do a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this. And if I keep that balloon theory going, the trick here is I need to bring you in with something that sounds musical. Um, and I always say professional. Professional to me really has nothing to do with... Um, whether or not you're getting paid. I, I don't know where that came from. Professional to me is a sound. When something sounds professional, it doesn't matter whether three people know who you are or three billion people know who you are. It's just that when you go to play, people hear you and go, oh, that's, that sounds good. That's, that's what I guess should be played right there. You know, David Gilmore for me of, of Pink Floyd is one of those guys. Every time he plays something, you just go, well, there's nothing I could do any better in there. That's, that's about as good as it gets. That, to me, is what professionalism is all about. And in order to do that, I have to be, again, in tune with the music that's being played. You know, David Gilmour is very aware of every chord as it moves. He's very aware of the tempo. He's very aware of his musical 
abilities or inabilities at that particular moment in time. He's not trying to do a bunch of things that he can't do um, because, you know, that's always keep in mind, every single human being has limitations. So even though we tend to put ourselves down and look at other musicians and put them on a pedestal, that's not true at all. They're just highlighting, we're just highlighting the things that we're good at. If I sat down and tried to teach you how to do, you know, essential country, you'd laugh at me because I don't, I don't have that ability. And by the way, um, I have some really, really, really wonderful plans for, for 2015 um, with just a ton of stuff that I've been planning for you and, and, um, and then the things that I'm, I'm just not capable of doing that you should learn about. I've got some awesome uh, friends that are going to be helping out with some of those things uh, to teach you some, some, some new stuff um, in areas that just aren't my expertise. I'm a blues rock dude. You know, that's the kind of stuff I love to play. I love to play pop music. I love to play ballads. I love all of those kind of things. Um, so yeah, it's going to be awesome. 2015 is going to be a really, really awesome year for, for you and, and uh, for us here at Guitar Zoom, just to start really finding some awesome things for you to continue learning. So remember, you can always email me with suggestions. I love when you do that. You know, you'll say, hey, you know, I would love to learn about this, or I would love to learn about that. Because if you do really want to do it, you want to learn about that, I would love to teach it to you. And if I can't teach it, I'm going to find somebody that can. Um, so anyway, um, that's what I want you to think about. Now, if we keep going, it says, um, guitar courses instructed on the utilization of pentatonic boxes, um, partial use of pentatonic or blues scales. And then it says here, um, one way is to emphasize the highest part of the relevant positions when moving up and down the fretboard. Playing this way might highlight the boxes on the th highest three strings when moving away from some full position. Well, again, I, I, what's basically being said here is, is, is should you play, at least I, as I understand it, on the first three strings more to create your melody and, and bending and sliding and all that sort of thing. And again, I think that's, a, that's completely a personal flavor. The truth is your melody, for the most part, is on these three strings because you don't sit down here and do that all day long, you know, it, it would sound like a, a baritone guitar, obviously. Um, so you're going to go down there a little bit, but if you always remember, what I like to talk about a lot is dynamic contrast. And that's just kind of a broad term to mean opposites, right? If you're playing low, follow it up with something a little bit higher. And then even higher. but then move into something else. Again, unless I'm in the middle of that balloon and I run, who knows, right? Whatever it's gonna be. Um, then I'm in the middle of that balloon and I'm trying to make something happen. But when I come back out again, I'm gonna contrast that with something else. So for me, one of the big rules that I use when I solo is dynamic contrast. If it was loud, try and play soft. If it was high, try and play low. If it was fast, try and play slow. If you're playing all the time, stop playing. You know, learn to use pauses when you play. Don't play all the time. Don't. Because even though you're stopping on notes and, and adding vibrato, there's no breathing room. You're just talking and talking and talking and talking. The trick is, is do something, then stop. And then one. Then stop again. You know, learn how to breathe musically by physically stopping the vibration of your strings to create space, which is your breath. And then you come back in. And if you remember that dynamic contrast element, that's really, really important because um, it keeps things from getting boring for you um, visually. You know, vertical versus horizontal is a dynamic contrast to me. Sometimes I'll play vertically, sometimes I'll play horizontally. Sometimes I'll do string skipping, sometimes I'll do intervallic playing. I mean, octaving, you know, open strings, tapping. You know, there's a million different things that you can do. But you don't kill any one technique too much because if you do too much of it, then again, the audience goes, oh, I've heard that a million times before. For me, Eddie Van Halen's a prime example of that. Eddie Van Halen is one of my absolute favorite guitar players on the planet, but he's been summarized over the years now as just being that tapping guy. He's just the guy that does a lot of tapping. 
And it's because there's tapping in everything that he did, but that's a stylistic characteristic of what he does. It's not the only thing he does. He does a million other things. But, you know, that's, that's kind of what happens. So, anyway, let's keep going here. We've got... Um, it says, uh, what would you, this is, this is Estevan, um, hello, and this is what he says. He says, um, what would you say are the best notes to accentuate for the blues? The minor, third, flat, five, the seventh, major, or minor? Well, okay, let's talk about that for a second. So let's say we were, again, in A minor pentatonic to begin with. Okay, so we're in A minor pentatonic. Now, Always remember that there are two different categories of notes. There are color tones, or we'll call those, I, I guess, let's stay away from the word color right now. We'll come back to that. There's chord tones, and there's non-chord tones. Chord tones would be like your root, your third, and your fifth. And then if you're playing blues, it would be your seventh, right? Okay, so from the, the chord tone aspect, any of those notes can be emphasized, the root, the third, the fifth, and the seventh. But as you move through, the root, for instance, is obviously something that we need to emphasize once in a while because it's the root. I mean, we need to, we need to go back to home plate when we're playing baseball. But we don't need to do it every time, and that's the mistake, kind of the rookie mistake, is that we're always playing the root. So A, we're playing A. D, we're playing D. you got to start there. you got to start somewhere. But that is a very colorless sound because it's already being played by your band or your rhythm track or whatever. You know, if you go to play over a, a, a blues track in the key of A, your bass player is playing A, right? The other guitar player is solo or playing a rhythm on A. So the A is already established um, to the nth degree. So we need to play it. We need to, uh, you know, we need, we're obliged to be able to utilize that, that root note, which is in this case is the A. But the third and the fifth, but certainly the third, is a much more colorful sound. And again, color is, is relative. I mean, everybody looks at this differently. But I'm just saying, if you play the same note over and over and over, after a while, it's not exciting anymore. So in the, in the, the, the idea of playing over minor blues, now this gets a little bit deep, and I actually have a, a, a class coming up, a, a master class called Modern Blues uh, Mastery. And what we do is we start looking further and deeper into the aspects of the blues and how to make them a bit more modern, a bit more fusion, um, if you will, um, which, which will take what, what I'm going to talk about right now to a much further degree. But, but let's just think about it this way. If I was playing a minor pentatonic chord or A minor chord, so it's got that A minor sound. So I'm playing over a ballad or a blues progression or whatever it might be, and it's an A minor sound. And I play the root. It's gonna sound awesome. Okay, I'm bending to an A. Okay, but if I go to the third over the A, it's gonna sound a little bit more colorful. Okay, the fifth is still available to me. And I can emphasize the fifth as well. And in this case, because it's blues, I can emphasize that seventh, and it's going to sound awesome too. But those are still, there, there, there are some notes that are more colorful than other notes, but they're still part of the chord, and we want to emphasize those. Okay, so my personal order of importance would be the root, and then it would be moving on to the third, and then it would be moving on to the seventh, and then to a little lesser degree, the fifth. And I'm just saying that that's, that would, if I was going to have to pick, which I wish I wouldn't have to, but if I was going to have to pick, that's probably what I would say. But the trick is, the notes that are outside of that, and that actually comes back to another question, which I have so many questions to get to, so I'm going to have to speed up a little bit. Um, from Mike, Mike says... Uh, can you add the sixth and the ninth notes to the other four positions of the minor pentatonic scale? Um, and yes, you can. Um, you know, I, I don't always diagram all of that out when I'm in a hurry for, for doing things because I, you know, half the fun is, is sitting down and 
like when I was in school, when I was in high school and I was in college, I would always sit down with like a blank fretboard chart and I would chart everything out. So when I didn't have my guitar with me, this is, this is what I do with my free time. Uh, I would sit down with a fretboard, a blank fretboard on a piece of paper, just a regular piece of paper, and I would chart out so my brain was making a connection to the positional shapes and, and what the notes were. I would do that all the time. I haven't done it in a while, but it's, it's a wonderful idea. So it's kind of like tablature. My era grew up learning how to play by ear because there was no internet and all of those sorts of things. You just played by ear and you were so much more intuitive to what was happening on your fretboard because you did do it by ear. Um, and now because of you know Ultimate Guitar and all these online sources like that, and th I'm glad they're there, don't get me wrong, um, but some people are far too reliant on that all the time to where they just assume that whatever's written in front of them is correct and then that's how they play it. And of course, that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, a lot of the stuff on there is highly incorrect. But instead of taking the time to really try and listen and go, oh, that note's not right, they don't. They just, they just play what they see. So I've battled with this in all of my years of teaching of how much do I give to students for how much do I write down on a piece of paper for them and how much do I just give them a, a taste of how it works and what it is and then have them go home and really start trying to sit down and spend some quality time. Because I'm telling you, if you can see it, if you can really see it, you can play it, right? There's still the physical aspect, the technical aspect of whether or not you can execute whatever you're trying to do, but the physicality or the, the, the visualization of it is gone because you can see it. And, and again, you're going to find that as I answer questions, this is a recurring theme over and over and over and over is do I need to see this and is it beneficial? It's always beneficial. You know, if you only have one way of getting from here to the grocery store and that place is blocked, you don't want to die of starvation, right? You find another way of getting around there. And if there's somebody visiting you, you might take them a certain way because the Christmas lights are up or, you know, the pretty houses or who knows, right? A park or, I mean, the whole point is, is that's kind of what your fretboard is, is your fretboard is this availability for you to drive around and do all kinds of different things. Um, and the sixth and the ninth, so I'm going to come back to where I was. Those are what I call color tones. So if you were playing over this minor, A minor chord, and you were using the root or the fifth or the seventh or um, root third, fifth, seventh, again, some of them are a bit more colorful than the other ones for sure. But when you start stepping outside those notes, that has a really pretty and new color sound. which is the ninth. Um, that's what that note is called, as Mike was, was, was referring to. It's huge. It's a huge important note to be able to play. Now, do I want to play the ninth all the time? I can. I mean, it depends on the situation. But it's whether or not it needs to be emphasized, right? If I'm going like this... <laughs> And I'm playing a little bit funkier blues. I could still use that ninth, but it may have a little bit less colorful impact when I, as opposed to playing slow minor blues. Right now I'm playing faster funky blues, and maybe you won't notice it quite as much. Maybe it becomes less important. Maybe over the faster funk blues, the rhythm and the riffing becomes more important than the color of the notes. You see how that happens? I mean, again, we always just tend to generalize and go, well, I learned how to do this over a, this chord, so I'm going to do this all the time. The, the stylistic characteristic of what you're playing over makes all the difference in the world. If you're jamming over a funky thing, funk by nature is more rhythmic. If you're jamming over a slow power ballad thing, funky rhythms is not the most important thing. It doesn't mean that they can't cross-reference and do different things or borrow from each other, because of course they can. But if you're playing in minor ballad, the, the, the color tones that you're playing become way more valuable than in a funky fast blues thing or a, a fast funk thing. So uh, let's keep going here with what he's talking about. So minor third, well, let's go into the major side now. If I was playing major blues, so I've got an A major chord, the minor third is totally fine. But what's even cooler is when you start learning how to add the major third back in. Now all of a sudden you start getting a cool little minor third to major third sound. 
And that's where this next elevation into the kind of the modern blues thing starts happening is that you're not just minor and you're not just major, you're not using minor third, you're using all of this, but it depends on the situation. If you're playing minor blues, you're not playing a major third. If you're playing major blues, you could play the minor third or the major third, or you can implement them both and use them as an actual lick, which is pretty cool. Um, the flatted five, the flatted five, as, as uh, Estevan mentions in here, the flatted five is a is a passing tone. The blues note is what that is. It's this one. The flatted five is an unwanted sound over the chord. If you're playing an A chord and you go, you're going to get a diminished sound. That's what you're going to create. And that's not, again, this on its own sounds just fine, but over a blues progression, if you try and emphasize that flat five, it's going to sound really bad. The trick with the flat five is it's a passing tone. It's a color tone that you pass over. You use it in conjunction with other things. See, I'm still emphasizing my A right there, but I'm using the blues note in conjunction with other things to create this kind of chromatic passage. See what I mean? So that flat five, I'm not emphasizing it, but it is creating tension. So if I go to the flat five like this, but then I resolve it back up, I'm actually resolving it to the fifth of the A chord. That tension, just for that bit of time, is an awesome thing. That tension, but I gotta release that tension by resolving it to something else. So just playing an A chord and then going is gonna sound really weird unless you're trying to play Black Sabbath or something like that. So the flatted five, Estevan, not really the, the, the color tone that you're looking for with blues, with really anything. Unless you're looking for a bluesy sound, then you're using it as a passing tone over other things. Okay, so what are the most important elements to developing speed, asks Don. Don, speed. Uh, the, there's really, for me, there's three categories. The first category is learning to right pick, okay, with your, excuse me, right pick, right, right hand pick, which is down picking and alternate picking. You take a metronome, you take this down picking, or alternate picking, and you start learning to develop those. The trick to speed is that once you get the, the technique of down picking or alternate picking, and when I down pick, I just had a, a student this morning that we were talking about this. When I down pick, I have really three options. I can pick from my elbow, I can pick from my wrist, or I can pick from my fingers. Those are the three points that I can pick from. My elbow, my wrist, or my fingers. As I'm doing something that is fast, but not incredibly fast, I'm doing more kind of wrist and elbow motion, right? So if I'm going kind of thing. As it becomes faster, the trick is, is to try not to use so much muscle when you move and so much distance when you move. So I almost think of it kind of like, like you're kind of trying to get water off your hand. You're just moving your hand back and forth like this. Literally just like this, that's all you're doing. It's not all of this, you're not hammering a nail. When you want something that's slower and heavy, you hammer a nail. Now you're hammering a nail. As it gets faster, you gotta stop hammering that nail because you're trying to move in as relaxed a, a possible a, a availability, obviously. So, the important elements of developing speed, the first thing is, is taking your right hand, learning how to do that, and developing your down picking and your alternate picking. And those two elements you use with a metronome. Because if you're not using a metronome, you have nothing to A, B against, and if you were actually playing with a drummer, you still wouldn't be able to synchronize. The trick is, is learning how to alternate pick and down up pick synchronized with a metronome. Let me grab a metronome here. So for instance, I can't see what number that is. 176. 
So if I take this metronome and I start doing this. What I want to do is I want to do that exact thing. Right now I am doing 176. I'm doing two per click. And I want to do that for three straight minutes. The trick to this is, uh, Don, is I want to be able to do it it's not just all palm muting for metal. It's learning how to develop your down picking availability for anything that you'd ever do. Okay, but the trick is this: finding the right speed. If you try 176 and you can't make it all the way through that three minutes and still be able to synchronize to the tempo, because this is this is a really, and again I just talked about this uh, earlier today, but this is a really important aspect of, of playing. If you're not really synchronizing with what's being played, your drummer, your whoever it is that you're playing along with, you're pretending. You're not really playing, you're pretending like you're, pre you're playing. You, the faster you can get out of that whole world, the better off you're gonna be. Um, it's not about pretending and pretending like you're good or pretending in front of somebody that you can do something. It's, it's an individual ab ability of being able to really do something and building to that level to where you can accomplish whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. So the trick with this is if I was to set this at 176 and I was not able to synchronize to that metronome for three straight minutes, it's too fast. Okay, I'm trying to do something that I'm not able to do. If I could do it for a minute and a half, but then all of a sudden I just bailed and I couldn't do it anymore, it's just too fast. And you have to deal with that, okay? You want the ideal speed that you're looking for is that you can accomplish three straight minutes of doing this down picking technique, okay? You can get through it synchronized, but it is painful. You know, about a minute in, minute and a half in, two minutes in, you start going, wow, this is, this is pretty tough. But you're able to do it. If you are physically unable to do it, it is too fast. If you make it 30 seconds in and you can't do it anymore, you're fighting a speed that is not worth fighting. You need to back it off and you need to find the right speed and you need to, to humble yourself enough, which I've done a million times, to go, I, this is what I wish I was at and this is what I thought I was at, but this is where I am. And then you start building from that speed. Then you do the same thing with alternate picking. You know, if you're really, really efficient with alternate picking, you can start at a faster speed. And again, you do it for three straight minutes. Alternate picking is, once you get used to alternate picking, alternate picking is way easier to do than down picking uh, because it's just very efficient. It's just using, it's like running on two legs versus hopping on one leg. But down picking is harder. It requires a lot more raw effort. Um, but you develop both of those on the three minute technique using your metronome, finding the right speed. Then you move to your left hand, and I always use this technique, it's a 20 second technique, where what you do for 20 seconds straight, you do hammer on, it doesn't matter where you're on the guitar, I'm just gonna go to the fifth fret of the third string because I always do, okay? And I'm gonna do a hammer on from the five to the sixth fret, I'm gonna do a hammer on for 20 straight seconds. Now, hammer on and pull off, I should say. Now the trick with this is, is that it's not how fast you can play, although you are trying to do this hammer on pull off as fast as humanly possible. The trick is, you gotta get a really good hammer on and a really good pull off. Don't just put your finger on there and take it off again. Physically hammer and then pull that string. To develop those muscles and you do it for 20 straight seconds. Then you move to the third finger for 20 straight seconds. You do this for 20 seconds. Then you move to this one. Then you move to this one. And each one of those you do for 20 seconds. I don't care how good you are. 20 seconds of doing as hard and fast as you possibly can will wear you out. It doesn't matter how long you've been playing. You could be Steve Vai and it's still going to be hard to do. Okay? Then what you do is, after you do 1 to 2, 1 to 3, 1 to 4, you set your middle finger down and you go to 3. Then you go to four. Then you set your third finger down and you go to your pinky. And by the time you get there, your your arm will be burning. Okay? And then what you can do is is on off days, for instance, maybe you don't practice the whole sequence, maybe you just take the trouble spots. Your one two is gonna be fine. Your one three is gonna be fine. Your one four is probably gonna be pretty fine. These three are not gonna be fine. These two are not gonna be fine. They aren't for anybody. So you sit down and you just practice. This one, for instance, over and over and over and over. Trying to develop that element, okay? 
Um, that's what you do for your left hand. It's a great exercise to do on a daily basis. And then the last thing that you do is you start learning how to just synchronize your two hands together again with the metronome. <laughs> And I usually tell people to do groups of four, groups of three, and groups of two. So you do a group of four, which is just a chromatic exercise like I'm doing right now. You can do a group of three, which is like your, your diatonic scales if you know those. You just develop those. You get your groups of two, which is your pentatonics. And again, what I'll do is I'll take my metronome. And I'll make a bunch of different kinds of things. I mean, you can just play it up and down and it's perfectly fine. But I'll practice those techniques realistically. So instead of just playing through the, the scales, I set my metronome to keep trying to be harder and harder and harder. And I'll do that for 20 minutes, half an hour, hour. I'll just sit there and do the same thing over and over and over to develop that. And again, there's, there's a much more, you know, detailed conversation we could go on for an hour. And I, again, there's, there's stuff I have available through Guitar Zoom that talks about exactly what we're doing. But that'll get you started, Don. All right, let's keep going. We have got... Um, da -da 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 Yep, we already did that one, that's good. That was another question about adding the notes like the sixth and the ninth, um, which again, is available in my blue stuff, but but always remembering that if you can remember color tones versus non-color tones, okay? Or, I don't know why I keep saying that, I'm sorry, chord tones versus non-chord tones. And then within the chord tones and non-chord tones, there's kind of an element of what could be more colorful on either side. Every note doesn't work all the time when you solo, obviously. Some notes work a bit better than other notes. Um, for me, the ninth is a really awesome note. It's a really easy note to add in. Uh, the sixth, you have to be a little bit more careful of. You see, as I add that sixth in, it loses its blues flavor to a certain degree, and it becomes a little more... You know, one of the things that I, I try and explain to people is pentatonics are not starter scales, and then diatonics are the big boy scales. It doesn't work that way. Pentatonics provide a, a very important element to, to soloing, and diatonics then provide more color into your soloing. So if all you do is play diatonic all the time because you learned how to play diatonic in their big boy scales, all the notes become col less colored because you're using them all the time. If I play something that's pentatonic, and then I go, that note all of a sudden sticks out very colorful. It's, it's a very noticeable note because I'm not overusing it all the time. So you see, when I'm playing fast, I, I might do all sorts of different things, but when I'm playing slower, I have to be aware that that pentatonic scale is really important to set up my, my situation, and then I use my diatonic notes as color. So I'm not using them. I'm not, I don't live in the world of pentatonic versus diatonic. I live in the world where I use all kinds of different things all the time, um, depending on what needs to be done with the music that I'm listening to, the, the situation that I'm in. Not just can I play pentatonic or can I play a diatonic. I can play diatonic, therefore I'll never play pentatonic again. It's moving between the worlds is, is really the, the trick. Um, oh, hey, the three minute for alter, look at this. So Mark, um, you were just asking about the three minute exercises. Is there any other methods I should work on to get picking faster? And he says, I see some guys who shred, and I don't want to be some fast shredder. We all do to a little teeny degree, um, but enough speed to fit into some quick leads. And that is the point. Again, I've, this is what I talked about earlier. It's not about using speed all the time. It's about using speed in the right places. And that, again, I could look at all these names that I gave you earlier. They all do it. Um, and so the trick is, is not only developing the strength of your right hand, the strength of your left hand, but the big thing for you, Mark, is once you develop those two things, it's learning how to use them effectively within the context of the scales that you know. If I play... Uh the, the trick is, is, is can I use that as an element in my playing? So if I'm playing... Uh 
whatever it is, right? But then after I do that, I need to follow it up with something else. I can't just do that over and over and over. But the reason I'm, I'm doing those things is because I've developed the synchronicity between my two hands, which works much better when it's later in the afternoon. Uh, but that's the way it works. So if I was playing and I went... And then I decided to go into... Whatever it might be, right? And again, that, that would be way too much, way too soon. But that the idea, so if I move from something slower... You know, that's a much more realistic thing that I might do. Um, and that just comes, Mark, from practicing those scale shapes over and over and over and over and over with a metronome. Not just on their own, but, but really developing the availability of those things. So, ah, uh, oh, so Eldon, Eldon, hello, Eldon. You have, uh, it says, I like the way you explain the subject matter in your lessons. I have purchased a couple of your learning DVDs. I have learned some theory sporadically and intermittently, but would like to know how to put it all together. Boy, that is the trick, isn't it? Um, do you have any suggestions? Well, there's a couple of things. Number one is what I just referred to generically as forward motion. The trick is if you dabble in a little of this and you dabble in a little of this and you dabble in a little of this and so on and so on, the problem is, is it's hard to kind of culminate everything together into one uniform forward motion. So what you need to do, Eldon, is you need to, to really decide what is the element that you need most importantly at this at this stage in your life, right? You can study theory and you can study technique and you can study scales and you can study, you know, choral structures and blah, 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 and, and, and you should do all of that. But you have to start figuring out which one do you need to do first and what order does this need to happen so you can start making some difference in, in what you're trying to accomplish. Theory is an incredibly important aspect in my opinion, but theory needs to come after the generic concept of being able to move and create sounds and colors and rhythms on the instrument itself. Uh, and I went to college, and, and I'm not saying that in a weird way. I'm saying I still believe that. that. That is the element that makes blues and rock and roll and all these things a real art form that people respond to is the sounds that are being made. If you take, if I do this, and I play that chord, and I have you, Eldon, sing over the top, there's only two things that are going to happen. Either the sound that, that comes out of your mouth is going to match that chord, or it's not, right? But that's a musical element. It's not a, well, what is G? Uh, that's a G chord, and the notes of the G chord are G, B, and D. And it still doesn't, it still doesn't bring you any closer to being able to have the right pitch come out of your, out of your, out of your mouth. Um, it tells you what it is and how it functions, but it doesn't enable you to, to, to make a musical element with it. So... I'm not downplaying the importance of theory. What I'm saying is you just have to start finding what your order of importance is to, on your journey, on your path here to, to get to what you want to do. In my honest opinion, you start off, which I always try and teach people, you start off by developing an element of visualization on your fretboard. Scales. Pentatonic, for instance. You just start off by doing that. And then your pentatonic is going to lead into the blues. If, if that's what you like. So now you're developing the flat five and the ninth and all these other things. And then that's going to lead into, like I was talking about before, this modern blues mastery thing where now you're going to start moving into, you know, half whole diminished scales and hybrid scales and dominant scales and all these different things that can start kind of elaborating from that. But if you don't have the basis of the pentatonic, it's not going to do you any good. Now we shift this direction. Now we start developing a technical ability on our fretboard because if we can't play this stuff becomes useless. I can, I see these scales and I understand how to visualize them on my fretboard and whatever, but I can't physically play them. So technique now starts playing a, a part into this. And then you start moving into um, your theory. At, at that point, once you've developed those, those basic outlines of what I'm doing on my fretboard, how I'm seeing things, theory could be chordal theory, right? So I see a chord on my guitar and I understand that this chord is a minor seven. So now, some of those notes in that minor seven chord are chords or notes I'm going to emphasize on my fretboard because I've been memorizing my notes on my fretboard. So it kind of sounds like I'm running around in circles, but that's the trick. Okay. So if you take someone like, 
again, I always pick on this poor guy, but you take someone like B.B. King, who is, to me, an amazing guitar player, but he is limited on a lot of things because that's not who he is. He doesn't sit around trying to figure out all of his theory and, you know, he doesn't sit and do speed picking exercises. But if we're going to be honest, he has limitations. B.B. King has limitations. What he does, he does as good as anybody could possibly do. But he can't do 10 other things. He probably doesn't want to do 10 other things. I don't know. I don't know the guy. But there are other players out there that can do 10 other things. But maybe they don't do blues as well as B.B. King does. So you see, this is, this is the trick, Eldon, is where do you want to go? I mean, what are you trying to develop? And, and what road do you need to take to get to that development? Um, theory is a great thing to talk about. But without application, there's nothing we can actually do with it. Um, so once we've got the application side of it, we can play elements on the guitar. Then our theory can start taking us to the next level. Theory for me is I listen to a chord progression, and then I analyze what, what I'm going to do with that chord progression. Where am I going to go? What scale do I want to play? And that sort of thing. And then once I've established those things, I'm still going to go in, in and intuitively start trying to make music on a musical level. So if that kind of makes sense. So Eldon... Plan out your strategy, and of course, there's use the Guitar Zoom community. Use, use, um, you know, Guitar Zoom support. We've got a guy by the name of Mark that does um, wonderful support on on uh, the Guitar Zoom community. He's an awesome guy. He's a smart guy. Um, you know, he's just he's just he can help you with these sorts of things and sort of figuring out what is the next direction for Eldon. What do you need to focus on first? Because if you're scattered in 50 different directions, that's exactly the problem, and and we've all gone through it. Um, but it's starting to make some pro progress in certain elements to get to where you want to go. Um, let's see. Andrew says, um, I purchased your 96 Rock Licks and it helped me playing, uh, helped my playing tremendously. That is awesome to hear. My question is, do you have a Country Licks lesson? No, but it's coming. It is coming and it will not be for me. But I'm telling you, the awesome thing about country licks is that you can use them very much in your playing, in a blues aspect, and you can use them in your major soloing. Not just country music, but in, in just major key soloing. And if you've ever tried to play in, like if you know your diatonic stuff, like your modes, you know that minor key soloing is way easier than major key soloing. Major key soloing is very limited. It's just easier to flow around in minor. And uh, so this country lick stuff and, and all this major key stuff that, that's going to be coming in 2015 is going to be so awesome for further developing that side of your playing. So it's coming. And let's see. This says, um, uh, hi, this is from Jake. Hello, Jake. I'm deciding between the cage system and the theory made easy. It looks like the cage system is covered in the theory made easy, but it doesn't go as in-depth as the cage system DVD. Um, please let me know. And Jake, the answer is that is exactly the answer. The theory, in the theory made easy, what I tried to do is I tried to give you, what I always try and give you is this is an item. This is a, a, a subject, a topic, a, a whatever. And this is how to realistically use that subject or item or topic in the real world. Um, what frustrated me to no end when I was growing up was I could watch these players that I loved and they would play these crazy licks and whatever, and either I figured them out or I had the tab or whatever, but I could never use it. I could never, there were two different worlds for me. There was all this stuff I was learning how to do, and then there was the real world where I was playing with friends of mine or whatever, and I couldn't use any of that stuff here in the real world. And so in that music theory made easy, the, the point with, of the cage section in there was to apply some elements of theory in a realistic manner. And people liked it so much that I decided to go far more in depth with the cage system, which for me, cage was absolutely life-changing. Absolutely. Um, I can't even tell you how important it was to my playing. Before I knew caged and after I knew caged, my approach to my fretboard was night and day different. And so it was one of the best things that ever, ever happened to me. And that's why it was included in the theory, and that's why it was more elaborated on in its own system. So they're, they're really two independent things. Um, you know, there's going to be a little bit of overlap, but, but the caged in the theory aspect is understanding how theory and caged are working together. And caged on its own is really the just overall development to the nth degree of, of using that caged. So uh, we only got a couple more minutes. Um, but let's see here. 
Let me try and get to this a little bit. Jeremy has a very long email, um, which is okay, Jeremy, no problem. I'm, I'm uh, perfectly fine with that. But uh, it says, one of the most frustrating things I've found as a guitar player is to learn a song from start to finish, only to forget it almost in its entirely once I've moved to the next part. Um, and let's just keep that element, because this kind of goes into learning songs, it goes into learning everything, and it's kind of what I talked about before. What I try and teach people how to do is to focus. It's focus practicing. Otherwise, it's a bunch of information that doesn't really make any difference. Think about it this way. If, if I met you, Jeremy, the first, the first thing I need to do is I need to look at you and I need to memorize your name. I need to make an association in my head that you are Jeremy. If I just call you Jeremy tomorrow, I'm never going to remember who you are, right? But, <coughs> excuse me, if I can make that connection for the rest of your life, for the rest of my life, I'm going to know your name is Jeremy. I do the same thing when I'm trying to teach people how to sing or teaching, you know, how to memorize lyrics and things like that, like I'm a Montessori teacher as well. So when I'm teaching people about singing, they can't just be words because it's very easy to forget them. You think you know them, and this happens to all of us. You think you know something, and then you get in a situation you play and go, how did I forget that? Okay, you have to make an association. You have to pull out whatever it is you're trying to do and focus on it. Really think about what it looks like, what it sounds like, what it feels like. You know, if you can make some sort of elemental association to what it is that you're doing, it becomes part of you and it becomes much more useful to you. So the, the, the trick to learning songs is it's not a matter of grabbing an idea and then developing it and then grabbing an idea and developing it. it and again, I don't know how else to explain this. It's taking that idea and like for me, when I listen to a song, and I'm going to use something that's pre-constructed versus improvisation right now. If I'm going to learn something that's pre-constructed, something that somebody else has done, the first thing that I do is I listen to that song over and over and over and over and over until I get a visual feel of that song. I get a visual feel of the movements. I can't see everything right now. I can't see what the chords are and I can't see all the scales and the licks, but I can hear them and I know when they're coming. Okay? If there's something that's confusing about the song, I have to listen to that over and over and over until I smooth it out. Okay? I call it clearing. Okay? And I teach this all the time to, to students. But clearing is basically when you're looking through a window and, it's, and the window is hazy, you can't see what's happening outside. You can see shapes, you can see movements, but you have no idea what's happening. When you clear that window, when you clean that window, when you do whatever, you, you move stuff away from it, you can see out there and you can see exactly what's happening. With songs, that's exactly what I do is I, I have to get it in my head. I have to clear that song if it's something I'm going to play, if it's something that I care about, if it's something I want to learn, if it's something I'm going to perform. I cannot have pitfalls in this song because those pitfalls lead to issues, whatever those issues are. So the more I listen to the song, and I mean intensely, and you could ask my family, we'll be driving for four hours to, to go wherever, and they'll all fall asleep, and I will just listen to the same song over and over, or the same section of a song over and over. And I do it over and over until I have the availability to see it. Now when I sit down to play, I already know how everything sounds, and I can already have a visual picture in my mind of what things look like. I don't know the chords, I don't know the scales, I don't know the licks. But as soon as I start associating those chords and scales and licks to that idea, I've already made the association in my head. So now it's a physical thing, right? It's not a mental thing. So now as I'm listening to that song and I've been practicing, maybe I'm not physically prepared for that song yet. I can't play it as fast as it's supposed to be or whatever. But I can now listen to the song and see myself playing that song. Even though I'm not physically able to play it, I can see myself playing that section or those two sections or those three sections. I never sit down and take the tab to a song and try and play through for four minutes. Ever, ever, ever. I will sit down. If it's a song that's difficult, if it's easy, then obviously there's nothing to worry about. But if it's difficult, I need to learn this piece. I, need to, I can already see it. I can, I can already hear it because I've done that association. But now I need to, to learn how this goes. Now again, I might not physically be able to do it, but I can I can see what I'm supposed to be doing, like this. Right, whatever, you're gonna play something, okay? But you're not physically capable, you can still see it, so when you hear the song playing, you can see what you're supposed to be doing, 
okay? And maybe you only do one segment or two segments or three segments depending on how difficult the song is and you see it. Then you grab your guitar and you start chopping through and you start f developing that. If the song is so hard that you can't do those three elements, then the song is too hard. Start with something easier and start developing all of these elements. It's really important to be able to do that. Don't just, don't just go with, um, you know, don't try the most impossible songs and then you can't see them and you can't develop them. Always start with something a little bit easier and develop from there. So I hope I answered, uh, I didn't get to, to everything, but I hope I got to a lot of your questions and, and um, you know, just answered some stuff for you. And, and so please keep practicing, stay with a positive attitude, stay on those community pages, keep asking questions, keep finding answers, but most importantly, stay on a direction, stay on a path. Um, you know, don't constantly be sidetracked because you're not going to accomplish those goals. Keep working on it and, and let me know your progress. I'd love to hear about it. So anyway, take care. Uh, have a wonderful weekend and I will speak to you soon.